sometimes things are not immediately apparent. So yesterday we celebrated the feast of Thomas the Apostle who doubted that Jesus was raised. And so Jesus came and appeared to Thomas. But Thomas said something that wasn't even immediately apparent in the presence of the resurrected Christ. His response is, my Lord and my God. He could not see directly the divine nature of Jesus Christ. He could only see Christ in his risen, fully expressed, you might say, human state. So he still had to have faith. He had to accept certain things that go beyond the evidence. Today, we see something similar, don't we? And this is before Jesus Christ dies. It's before he rises. It's before he ascends. It's before he sends his Holy Spirit. And these folks in this gospel are all like, aren't you that kid that grew up down the street? Yo, what in the world? What gives here? Who are you to make these claims? This is simply not immediately apparent. Now, the good news is that we know that if we follow the history of God's chosen people, which now includes all of us, what do we see? People do come to fuller, deeper understandings. We can see people like St. Paul, who not only does he keep come to a deeper understanding as regards who God is, he goes from persecuting Christians and killing them to calling people to Christ, to himself suffering for the sake of the kingdom. That's amazing. And you and I have those same gifts. You and I know that Jesus Christ is risen. We know that Jesus Christ is perfectly human, which means sin holds no sway over him. He's free above any of those bounds. So just because he doesn't choose to go smoke crack or something like that, it doesn't mean he's less free because he's exercising less libertine decisions or something like that. No, he's fully free. He's fully expressed, and he shows us something. Now, this is important to keep in mind um, because we find ourselves celebrating this interesting experience called the United States of America. We celebrate this interesting experiment every 4th of July. Unless you think I'm, I, I, what I'm about to preach, unless you think I don't love my country, no. When we properly love, we want the best for the beloved. So I just want you to know that you're going to hear some things that may challenge you wherever you are in the political spectrum. Not because I'm trying to be a provocateur today, but because I think it's important that we look at our country in a fuller light of some things we know through divine revelation and, and, and reasoning based upon that divine revelation. There's a couple things we know. We know something that John Lewis knew. Did you know that John Lewis, when he was a kid, he was so poor, but he loved, so much loved going to church, he'd go home from church and he'd preach to the chickens. That's pretty awesome. And he's the same guy that ends up leading important marches during the Civil Rights Movement. Edmund Pettus Bridge being one of those places across which he led a march. And people paid a price for that. And you would also rightly recognize that if you read historians who are kind of really more up to date now, they're kind of sharing inconvenient truths, that if you go back about 400 years, you look at like the West Indies Company, some of these companies out of places like Portugal, France, more recent Johnny's come lately, would come a little bit later like England, that slave trade, treating certain members of our race, our species, we have one race, it's a human race, we're being treated as property. And we saw that got kind of, kind of get codified into laws based on some philosophical major premises that were flawed, flawed. And so problems followed to where for a good chunk of our country's history, we had certain members of the, 
the human race that we're treated as less than fully human. And we're treated as objects and sold and held as property. Now, this hasn't ended. It still happens today in many forms. Now, that's one aspect. We could also look at the native, or the, oh, I like to say the indigenous American experience between a variety of tribes over which we ran roughshod and just did a land grab, just took their land away. Now, unless you think I hate my country, I'm a paratrooper, I'm a veteran paratrooper, I'm a veteran naval officer, I love my country. But our country is flawed, and our country is somewhat beautiful. Because it's also true that in this country, we have a certain ability to pursue happiness. But we're told that all men are created equal. Created, interesting, we're not our own creators. All men, we could rightly recognize today, all people. Imagine, it's not that long ago that women couldn't vote. It's pretty shocking, right, for people growing up today who might not know their history. Imagine your mom not able to vote. That's pretty shocking. Um, all kinds of interesting things. So who do we include? I think in terms of like, we can look at issues of racial justice and equity, but we can look at that and say, wait a minute, didn't Father Chris just say we're a single race? Absolutely. To say otherwise, to say that somehow in God's creative act, he built certain things in so different between certain people of our race who look different or have different attributes or are somehow not quite on par. Now, those are attributes. We could talk about human attributed dignity, and that has its place, right? If there was no recognition of attributed dignity, we'd have no promotions at work. In places like the military, we wouldn't have something like Medal of Honor. Um, so attribution is not a bad thing, but it's not at the depth. It's only, only a certain aspect of the human condition. Intrinsic dignity. Now that's a radical point of equality. Now, where this rubs on what some might perceive as the opposite end of a political spectrum is when we talk about wanting to define members of our species as not fully human or not persons until certain attributes are actually in play. So, for example, there are parts of the world today where infanticide is legal, just like there are parts of the world today where a caste system is very well in place. I'm not going to pick on those areas, although I'm not a cultural relativist either. I think we would agree that caste systems are not really a good practice. And I think we would agree that reducing human beings in an objectified and objectifying way to not being fully human unless there are certain attributes in play poses a problem. It poses a big problem because it would say that, okay, if those attributes aren't there and we argue as do some, erroneously, I think, such as Peter Singer, that you have a simple human being that's not yet a person, a subject of rights, then it's okay to treat that simple human being as less, as not the same as all these other human beings. And in some cases, if you read Animal Liberation by Singer, which I highly recommend, it's an excellent thought-provoking read, um, even would have perhaps arguably less rights than members of other species that have a greater combination of attributes. Is this person yet sentient? Or this, you know, so we can start to see that, wait a minute, wait a minute, we got to get it right. Like in this gospel, praise God, you and I understand that, human, that, that Jesus Christ is not merely a human prophet. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. And we also have so much information we need upon given, uh, you know, revelation and reasoning and inquiry based on that revelation, very reason and approach, that actually every member of the human race is fully personal. You might say, well, where do you get that? Well, our patron, Thomas Aquinas, in the Summa Theologia, on his tract on the angels, helps us understand our human condition by basically showing we're not angels. We're not spirits wearing bodies that are just our instruments. 
And we never have a body without a soul, without a soul that goes with its species, its specific difference. In this, we can talk about plant souls, animal souls, all kinds of souls. Anything animate, anything alive, in this sense, has a soul. But human beings are not dual beings. Like, after we're raised from the dead, after the second coming of Christ, it's not just our souls resting in peace. Even our mortal remains, whether I'm burnt whether I become shark food, whether I'm buried and embalmed, whatever's left of my mortal remains, and we, we, this is all great mystery, but we know that too will be raised together with our souls. We remain human. We'll be glorified, fully glorified humans in heaven. That's our goal. And the goal of us is to bring everybody on board. We want to be maximally inclusive. That's the reality. So to love our country is to love our country, to want the best for our country, even with its imperfections, even with its sins. Hey, to enslave people, that's sinful. To run roughshod and take their land, that's sinful. There are things, right? Without demonizing necessarily, without like starting World War III, but we know we've got to pray. And we know we've got to work toward that. And we know that in the fullness of these truths, these inconvenient truths in some ways, we should speak, we should engage, and we should be engaged and be engaging. Bottom line, wherever I happen to be, whomever I am on the political spectrum, I might be somebody who believes in bigger government solutions. I might be, in a sense, left of center. That's okay. I can be left of center and pro-life. I might be somebody uh, right of center. Well, if I'm right of center, maybe I need to remember, be a patriot, love the country, don't be a nationalist. <laughs> don't, you know, so, 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 so be thinking about that in terms of the fact that we are all God's children. God's call to salvation is universal. He wants everybody, and he wants us helping others know his presence through the way we walk, through what we talk, through what we do. Praise God, we've got so many good folks in this parish doing so many good things on so many levels. Maybe today, just take a moment to be grateful for that and remember to pray for our country. We love our country while recognizing that our country is not perfect and yes, we still have quite a ways to go. Amen. Thankful to God who empowers us to know him. We now rise and together we profess what we know to be true. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us men, for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Knowing we are loved by God, we raise our eyes and prayers to our Father who hears us. For Pope Francis, Bishop Doherty, Father Tom, and all priests, religious, and catechists who are called to serve our Lord through teaching and preaching, when they meet those who are hard of face and obstinate in heart, 
Keep them strong in faith, O Lord, and help them to continue sharing your word and love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all political and world leaders, that they ensure the dignity of all men and women and the safety and care of those whose homes, livelihoods, and lives are at risk. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the student, family, and resident parishioners of St. Tom's, that our eyes and hearts may always be open to the prophets in our lives. May we continue to listen for the voice of God present in those around us. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 